Right, good afternoon everybody. Um, I'm going to talk you through some of the unmanned aircraft developments we're doing at CSIR. I apologise to some people who may have seen some of these slides before. Um, there's a history that we tend to show on a regular basis. Um, basically we'll do the, a very brief overview of who CSIR is, and then the history, recent and current airframes we're working on, um, a little bit about our UAV lab or UAS lab, and um, our current projects and where we're going and um, where we see ourselves fitting into the UAV industry as a whole. So, very briefly, um, we fit under Defence and Security, um, groups called Defence Peace, Safety and Security. It was the old Defence Tech, and under that there are a number of um, research groups, um, or well, competency areas first. So, I'm in the aeronautics competency um, in error structures. I head up a, two small groups, one that does unmanned aircraft, one that does flight clearances on manned aircraft. All right, going through some of the history, and I'll go through quite fast, so quite a few slides to, to get through here. Um, the early, from my, my sort of era at CSI, the early airframes, 1980 was the first Seeker um, airframe, and uh, working with, with Kentron at the time, um, prototype was built, flown at the San Luis test range, and uh, as you guys know, it became a product at Denol later on, and they took it further, um, developed it further in Seeker 2 and Seeker 400, and um, that's where everything basically started uh, from our side. We did one or two other projects that we can't say too much about, but then in 1990, we, um, having done some work on a delta wing airframe, um, we had some uh, wing optimization codes, there was a need for a target drone, and so we actually developed a, a small low-cost target drone as, a, again, a demonstrator. The undercarriage is, is just for the initial flight tests. Um, and we basically demonstrated that it could fly, but we weren't really in the right market to do, do products as such. We, at the same sort of time, designed OVID, or ACE as it was called later on. That was an all-carbon fiber military trainer, turboprop aircraft. Um, first of its type in the world, and interestingly now, um, Diamond in Austria is building what they're calling the first all-carbon fiber trainer, um, where we're now 28 years later. But this was a prototype, not a product, uh, tested at the flight test center, and um, got as far as, as demonstrating the, the airframe, and that's the end of the project for us. It didn't go any further, and that's typically what does happen. 92, we built Kenai. Um, not a true unmanned aircraft with autopilots, just a radio controlled airframe, just a demonstrator. And uh, that was part of a bid with um, what is now Paramount uh, Advanced Technologies in ATE. Uh, so my colleagues here and I worked on this together. Um, for me to span, the long range is nothing really special. Uh, with petrol, 500 kilometers is quite doable, that size airframe. But we did use some of the codes that we had previously developed and um, that made it quite quick to do and to demonstrate. We built a two-seater light aircraft called Hummingbird. Um, the technologies here were pre-preg autoclave cured composites. And interestingly, it was done to a, a, an army specification. One of the army colonels wanted a, an air wing in the army. And he wrote a specification. Um, we actually did put a bid in for it, but uh, didn't win the bid. Um, as it turned out, the amount available was too low anyway to develop a complete air, air, um, airframe. So we uh, used our own internal funds and built that airframe. It was in uh, flew at, at uh, Owatambo and went to Paris Airshow. Right, 95, we took that airframe I spoke about earlier, the, the radio controlled one, um, ATE, uh, was awarded the contract for what is now the Vulture system for the Army, and we then worked with ATE and developed the, the Vulture uh, airframe. If you look on the left-hand side, that's the, one of the prototypes uh, mounted in, on the old test rig in the 7-meter wind tunnel. We had a gap of about 10 years. We weren't involved in unmanned aircraft um, for no really good reasons. Um, until 2003, 2004, we had a contract to develop a, a system for, uh, for a client that we um, still not at liberty to talk about. But we said, if we can do this, let's do one ourselves. We can actually go and, and demonstrate. And so we built this little two-meter span um, hand-launch system. 
Uh, we characterized it in the wind tunnels because we could basically, and um, we found a lot of bits were missing in our design process, especially things like swap propeller performance data and um, engine modeling and things like that. Soon after that, we built a, uh, a different team within our group, we built Sequa, um, a platform that's unstable. The autopilots and batteries move back inside the airframe on rails. So you can take off as a stable aircraft and make it slowly more and more unstable or less stable. And um, it was a design optimization uh, project. And um, as such, there were, I think, eight computers running on the optimization, one doing overall system, um, six different Air Force sections, six different computers being optimized at the time, and one looking at the flying quality side. So the final geometry wasn't actually drawn on CAD. This, this is what came out of the computer. The computer said, that's the shape, and that's your overall geometry. And then um, CAD was used to define the outer model line for manufacturing, but the cord lengths, the wing sweep, the taper ratio is all done by the optimizer. Um, right, 2010, we got funding from DST, the Department of Science and Technology, to develop a platform that could be used for research. A lot of people in the electronics or control side of things were looking at developing autopilots, but then they build an airframe as well. And quite often these guys were not um, aeronautical engineers, not even mechanical engineers. And they were building or spending a lot of time building airframes that they would um, use uncharacterized, but in a way that they could at least put the systems into. And so we got funding from DST to develop a, a platform that we would characterize and make available. And so um, that became the modular UAV, or UAS, because we have an autopilot about, um, developed by Selimosh University. And it was characterized in the wind tunnel, power on, power off, so fully characterized. And we had about 14 or 15 undergrad and postgrad topics related to that. There were other configurations um, that we looked at as well. So the, the twin fuselage configuration is to give no single point of failure. So there's two motors. Um, there's two rudders, two elevators, two flaps, two ailerons, two of everything. Um, so the guys could look at single point of failure detection and then immediate that with the autopilot. And um, while we're doing this, we said we can actually make different configurations where we have a gas turbine engine mounted on top and it becomes a gas turbine test bed. We can make it electronically unstable, not moving center of gravity around, but making the stabilizer um, actively controlled to vary the stability as you want it to. So as I said, it was tested power on, power off. Um, and then a lot of the um, controllers were developed from the wind tunnel data that we had. And we gave one airframe to Salamash University. One's available for um, UJ. It's sitting at the CSR, but it's effectively their airframe as well. It will be doing work on next, or hopefully this, this uh, calendar year. And then again, we used the wind tunnel data to validate our tools including propeller, thrust, and things like that, and power effects. 2013, um, we built a more ruggedized, more um, simpler to manufacture version of our Deezer uh, unmanned aircraft system, and it demonstrated various camera modules on it, um, as it has there, that's a dual camera system. So it wasn't a full zoom, there's just two different cameras you can switch between. And we basically flew this at, at border safeguarding exercises for the the Army in particular, but Air Force and Navy were there as well, um, to understand what small UAVs can do and what they can't do. Um, more realistically, what they can't do. The, the impression people had was, like in the movies, you can pick up another plate from two kilometers away, or you can zoom in and get that information. And so it was good for them to see what you can actually see with a PAL video on, on sort of low-cost small systems. Um, it's a hand launch system with a bungee typically. Um, I said a bit ruggedized. We've got a tracking antenna system that, that follows it. We, we can go 10 kilometers away if we needed to. But the border safeguarding is typically in the controlled airspace, um, but, but much closer in than that. Um, maybe I should say we did have one, one exercise, the first one. We actually had a, a satellite link uh, from our little hand launch UAV. Um, when we take the video from the, the, the UAV itself, uh, to the ground station, and from there via Inmarsat and back again. And the, the latency is about six, seven seconds. So you could actually, during the, the test setup, walk in front of the camera, wave at it, walk around to the control room, and then wait a few seconds, and there's you waving. 
but it did show we could actually take that video and stream it to anywhere in the world effectively. And um, so we flew it with the, uh, the police um, control room watching our, our video. Those exercises also showed us there was a need for a through the night mission, a, an eight hour duration mission. Um, if you could do it silently, that would be the, the best solution, but um, if you had a combination of petrol and electric to be silent for part of the mission, that was good enough. So we, we developed a longer wing version of the modular UAV, and um, that got built during 2014 into early 2015, and then the regulations that came out mid-2015 meant we weren't actually allowed to, allowed to fly it, and we, we couldn't fly it at that stage. And the border safeguarding exercises had stopped as well. So that's as far as we got on that airframe, and it still sits in the lab ready to go. So we went back a bit to some of our old role of building uh, unique airframes. Uh, Telemet wanted to have an airframe to demonstrate the avionic systems, and so that's what we did. We, in the space of, I think it's about eight or nine months, did the concept design, the predictions, the characterization, built the, the airframe, um, built it in our labs, in fact, as it turned out, it worked out um, cheaper and faster than outsourcing, which is unusual. Typically, we try and outsource where we can. I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, and that has flown since, and apparently flew very nicely. Uh, 2014, we looked at um, helping Janelle with the uh, Hungwe system. They had a, a small platform with the elevator behind the prop um, at, that was not optimized for, for what was seen at that stage by DS3 in one of the more critical missions, which was the border safeguarding anti rhino poaching missions. So we used a, an optimizing system. We optimized the airframe. Um, and then um, handed the design back to Danelle, uh, Epsilon did the manufacture, and Danelle went on to go and do the initial flight testing. So that takes us really to the um, US laboratory, our, our lab that we're working from. Uh, what do we have there? It's, we don't have a huge amount of funding, so we have sort of small and simple test systems. We can do structural tests of wings, for instance, up to three and a half meter span. We have a neutral measurement rig. We have a rig that's not, um, still not complete. Those you saw this slide a year or two back. Um, we haven't got any further on that. We, it's a student project. A student uh, went back overseas, and we haven't had the funding to continue with it. But we need to characterize servos, so we have the server speed under load um, to put into our, our uh, simulations. Uh, gas turbine rig um, is largely con completed. And we have a small composite layup room and the CNC router and bits and pieces. We built a small propeller test rig. One of the issues we have, looking at long endurance of eight hours, propeller efficiency comes into that. And um, we had no way of getting good data from commercial props. It isn't out there. And so again, this is three different students, uh, two Dutch, one German, and we built a small propeller test rig um, that sits in the wind tunnel and we can now characterize the props as we need to and measure the flow properties behind the prop, the swirl and the wake and everything. Uh, need to speed up just a little bit here. The small gas turbine test rig um, in the right hand picture there, that fits on the modular UAV. Again, the UAV becomes a test rig. If the engine fails or blows up, uh, which does happen, um, we can still fly back with electric motors and come in and land the system. But we can acquire data in flight, especially at altitude, which is hard to get any other way. We have a couple of small engine test rigs, a reliability rig that measures all the engine parameters. But the idea is to run this for, for days ahead of the airframe flights. Um, it SMSs back on a regular basis how it's doing. And if it goes beyond limits, um, any of the parameters, it shuts itself down and SMSs back to us saying it has shut down. We have a design for a calibration rig um, that's not funded this year, sadly. Maybe next year we'll carry on with that. And an altitude simulation rig. And there's also a UAV Piston Engine Association of South Africa that has been started by one of my engineers that discusses all the issues on these engines to share information uh, from our side and to um, get information from others to help us as well. I'll skip this quite quickly. We have a US mission simulation to look at the mission simulation, not the UAV flying so much, but more where you can see how much ground it covers, where it hasn't seen by the way you move the camera around, and getting uh, mission effectiveness figures out of the uh, out of the mission. Current future projects: um, 
We've done some studies into high altitude long endurance version uh, of the modular UAV. We've done a study into a hydrogen fuel cell version, and there's some traction being gained there now. We have an actively controlled aerostat using UAV technology on an aerostat to make the aerostat controllable to handle higher winds. And we did a modular transonic research platform uh, study as well. Um, so at the moment we have LIMU, a long endurance modular UAV, electric version, two hours duration, petrol version, eight hours, 20 kilogram payload. Um, airframes built, we are integrating auto avionics this year. Um, and basically it's the same airframe for electric or petrol. So top right hand picture you can see the uh, right hand or left hand fuselage on the airframe um, is electric version, the right hand one is the petrol version, um, and it's basically a retractable undercarriage. And the payload part is now separate from the airframe, and that can be used for a number of different missions. We also have taken Indiza a bit further. We've got flaps on the airframe now. We're using lithium ion batteries as a way of getting a longer duration. We have a small um, pan, tilt, and zoom camera system that was designed and built in three weeks. Um, uses off the shelf components, uses Arduino boards for slew rate control, and um, it takes two different cameras, an infrared or daytime camera. Um, and that's been done as a demonstrator for, for a client. And uh, yeah, we'll be flying tomorrow. We're flying autonomously, we're flying no radio control, we just throw it and flies around and lands itself, but the landing accuracy has been improved on. And then finally, um, what do we do? So it kind of defines, I think, what, what I've said now. We design new novel UAV airframes. We can analyze them and characterize them, wind tunnels or empirical methods. We do all the predictions um, that are required for, for um, integrating autopilots and things. And we'll typically build one or two. We seldom build more than that. And we then outsource manufacture. And the longer term, we'd like to find more and more companies to outsource uh, integration to, um, flight testing, even take things into products, that's more what you're focusing on now. Um, so much as we'll go through the flight testing phase and we'll design what we think are reasonably uh, efficient airframes, um, it's really the guys out there that'll take it further into products that, that we, we're focusing on now. And then what I've covered is effectively our group as, as the aeronautics subsection. Um, we have other groups in CSR that do the sensors, the image processing, command and control, the cyber warfare composites, autonomous systems, things like that. That pretty much is what we're doing in UAVs at the CSIR.